morning, church, and happy Sabbath again. We have been looking at, in the book of Exodus, the sanctuary. Now, how many of you remember the first time why I wanted to have a Bible study on the sanctuary? Nobody remember, anybody remembers why? It is because the sanctuary is really important. And when you will look in Daniel and Revelation, you will also find the sanctuary. In a, in a word, the sanctuary is essentially a GPS that God is showing us where we are and where he wants to meet us. And we have been looking, as you can see, all the scripture reading has been from the furnitures, but we are looking at ancient Israel and see how God has been leading them through the sanctuary. It is important to see that it's after God has led them through the sanctuary that he tells them to make a sanctuary. So let's go back and look at how God has been leading the ancient Israel. And we also we are looking at how it is applicable in our time. So let's go to Exodus chapter 16. Now we know that in Exodus chapter 12, God had commanded them to kill a lamb, the Passover, and eat it with bitter herbs. And later, God took them on a journey in the wilderness and they were faced with the Red Sea, which is the laver, as we saw last Sabbath. Now, there is another furniture that we are going to look at. It's the table, of, the table for the showbread. And in chapter 16 of Exodus, let's read in verse 2, and it says, and the whole congregation and the Israelite murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. So, last time we saw that when they were faced with the Red Sea, did they cry out to the Lord? Yes. But how? They were complaining to Moses because he had led them out of Egypt and they were going to die because the Egyptians were coming behind them. Remember this? And now they had gone through the Red Sea in chapter 15. You see the song of Moses and of Miriam. And now they are getting hungry and thirsty and they again to start to complain to Moses. And in verse 3 he says that, And the Israelites said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and we ate, when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Were they hungry? Yes. Were they asking God to provide for them? Or were they complaining because they couldn't sit and eat to the full? Question? Were they hungry? Yes, they were hungry. But were they looking for food or is it greedy? Were they being greedy? Yes. Now, let me tell you something, an experience. That's my personal experience. <laughs> Don't ever complain to God about food. You know why? When I was in, at South Coastal Adventist University, I was in the dorm. That was the, the fall of 2010. Christmas break, I'm in, I'm in the dorm. The cafeteria is closed because school is closed and no money. What do you do? Ramen noodles. We are, when you have seven Haitians like me that can eat, that would not be if, um, enough for all of us. And we are complaining that, man, we are so hungry, there's no food. And we complained for about two days. And one of my friends that I met that same semester 
I went to work on, on one day, and when I was leaving, they said, hey, Mario, there's a bag for you. It's about this big and this tall. And he said, Merry Christmas. And in it, there was a bunch of food. Let me tell you something. Do not ever complain to God for food. I learned that that same semester. Why? Because we had so much food that we couldn't eat all of it, and it started to get bad. Don't ever complain to God for food, because God will give you enough food that you would wish you had never complained. And from that time, I never complained to God. Don't forget that. So were they hungry? Yes. But were they really hungry for food or were they being greedy? Because they wanted to sit and eat to the full. It is naturally good to eat to the full anyways. So God says, okay, I will give you food. And when you keep on down, as they keep on murmuring, in verse 12, God says, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. Did God walk here? Question. As they left Egypt, was God with them in the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night? Yes. As they, go, as they went through the Red Sea, was God not also with them? Yes. Did God not provide them with everything they needed? Yes. How can you think that God would not provide food for you? Why, would, why do you need to complain? Do we need to complain to God? No, because if God can provide security and peace for us, he can also provide food, clothing, and shoes, and etc. But we will see how they reacted when God provided them with food. In verse 13, and he says, And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay around the host. Were they asking for flesh? Did God give them flesh? Quails. Lots of quails. Remember, not only flesh, but also bread. Now let's see. 14, verse 14. And when the dew was lay, and when, when, when the dew that lay was gone up, Behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, as small as the whole frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they which not know what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. Some version, I believe, the New King James Version will say, they ask, one another, they ask one another what this is. Is that true? Who has the New King James Version? Who has the NKJV? The New King James Version? Nobody? Oh, wow. David, you have a New King James, right? New King James? What did he say in, your, in verse 15? So they asked one another, what is it? Now, if God gave you quails, meat to eat, flesh to eat, and you ask for bread, if you see something on the ground that God had laid for us, for you, would you, un would you ask what it would be? Or would you already know that it is the bread that God provided for you? But, uh, the reason is because there are in some place where he says what it is, is because it's common food. 
You might, you might have found that in some version that say because it was common. Now, man doesn't say that. But they were what? They were wondering what it was because they did not know what it was. Why did they not know what it was? Remember, they were in Egypt. We don't know what kind of meat they were eating in Egypt, nor what kind of bread. So when they see the bread that God has given them, it wasn't something they were familiar with. You see, what is the application today? We go first to what? To the altar of sacrifice, repentance. Second step, baptism, the labor. And then God says, I want you to feed from my bread. I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that again. I want you to feed from my bread. Now, which bread would that be? Thank you. Jesus, but also the word of God. Friends, we have been so used to eating. Oh, I'm going to say this. We have been so used to eating at Jezebel's tables, eating Jezebel's bread, using Jezebel's spices, when God give us his bread, when God give us his bread, we look at it as, what is this? We want to make it taste better. And how do we do this? We use Jezebel's spices, oil, drinks to make it taste better because you don't like it. I wonder if that is going on right now. Do we have people using the bread of God and trying to make it taste better? I wonder. So the Israelites, they were complaining, murmuring for food, and God gave them food not because they were hungry, but they were greedy because they wanted to eat to the full. How many times do we want to eat to the full when we're not supposed to eat to the full? But when God gives us his bread, we don't want to eat it to the full. Now, let me say this. We will not, I would say, ever eat this bread to the full because there are so many things in it. You can read one passage five times and then find something new in it that I can tell you because I have, actually. You can read a story in the Bible more than two times and you find different meanings all, this, all these times. But what is right now the present truth about the bread of God being used and not the way it was supposed to be. Let's see what present, present truth is about right now. How many of you have heard of many versions of the Bible? Oh. Let's compare some versions and see if it's the bread of God or if it is the bread of God that has been adulterated, I would say, because they have used the devil's words to make it sound better or taste better. One of them is the contemporary English version. In Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12, what does it say? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. Because people now are using the attributes of Jesus Christ and give them to who? To Satan. Chapter 14 of Isaiah, verse 12. I don't know what version you have, but mine says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, Lucifer, son of the morning? But wait, wait a minute. Who is the bright morning star? Let's go to Revelation chapter 22. Chapter 22, Revelation, 
and verse 16 and see if people have not taken the bread of God and make it taste better with their own words. Actually, not better, but for them. Chapter 22 of Revelation, verse 16. And he says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the church. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And how come they give that attribute to Satan? Satan is not the bright morning star, friends. He is the son of the morning. Jesus is the bright morning star. What version do you have? I don't know. But if you have one like this, that's called deception. Why? How can you take Jesus and give his, his attribute to Satan? Which one is true? Do you know? Let's look at another one. Good news translation. Why well, call that one bad news translation? The same thing again. They call who? King of Babylon, Lucifer, bright morning star. When Jesus says he is the bright morning star. What version do you have? Do you have a version that was being used with Jezebel spices also? And this is, what, this is present truth. This is the word of God being made to make people be confused about who Jesus really is. Now, let's see. How about uh, an emoji Bible? Huh? Yeah. Half post. A Bible made with emojis is now an actual thing. How about a Bible with emojis? Huh? What version do you need? <laughs> you know what? Let me say this one thing. From the Catholic website. The, the only Bible they called the Protestant Bible is the KJV. They said it themselves. I don't know what version you have, but if you want to buy an emoji Bible, I don't know. You go ahead and do that. But I wouldn't suggest it. I wouldn't say to do that. Now, not only they are, they are taking words from the Bible, they are replacing them with emojis. Okay. How many of you know someone by the name of Angel Manuel Rodriguez? Angel Rodriguez. Okay. Before I get there, I want to make sure we understand where I'm coming from and where we're going. How many believe that the Bible is the fundamental faith and practice of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Okay. Is it the only one? Did God also give us something else along with the Bible? What is it? Prophetic gift. I'm going to make a, give you a, a, a history of God talking to us in two ways, not just one way. In the time of ancient Israel, right now we are studying Israel, time of Moses and Aaron, was God with them all the way? So we can say they had the word of God because God is also the word of God. Who else did God give them? To speak to Moses. Who was Moses? A prophet. So we have the word of God, or God, and the prophet. Let's keep on further down. How about in the time of David and Saul and Solomon? Did they have the word of God? Yes. Did they also have a prophet? Samuel, David, and Saul. Yes. How about in the time of Jezebel and King Ahab, did they have the word of God? Yes. Did they also have a prophet? Now you're going to say, no, more you. This is the Old Testament. Okay, let's take it to the New Testament. 
John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, and the Word was God. And skip on down, the Word was made flesh and, who was that Word? Not only did they have the Word of God, the Bible, the Old Testament, they had the eternal Word of God. But who else did they have at that time? Who? John the Baptist. So friends, God always talked to us with the word, oops, and the prophet. Now, let's keep on down to chapter 12 of Revelation, verse 17. It says that, and the dragon was worth with the woman and went to make war with the seed, with the seed or with her seed, those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Where are the commandments of God found? It's in the word of God. Exactly. It's in the word of God. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Hmm? Let's go to Revelation chapter 19. Chapter 19, Revelation, and verse 10. We, all, we need to let the Bible interpret itself. And he says this, And I fell at his feet, John speaking, to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So which prophecy was John writing about at this time? And it wasn't the 70 week prophecy. The 1260 day prophecy. This is, that was the, our time prophecy, friends. That was the last time prophecy. If there is a prophecy, would God not raise up a prophet? Hmm. But now we have people like Angela Rodriguez that says the gift on the bottom light, the gift of Ellen White can enrich but not define our faith and practice. Let me tell you something. Ellen White says, if you reject the spirit of prophecy, you will also reject the Bible. And do you know which book that Satan has the most after the Bible, basically? It's called The Great Controversy Between Christ and Satan. Why? This book shows every single ways that Satan attacked the church. Either deception or the sword. Either deception or persecution. And this is right now. I don't know if the spirit of prophecy does not define your faith or practice, but it defines mine because everything that she had been saying are now happening. If you look at the news, you can see the world in a different way. Let's move on. More. Okay. How many of you remember in September 2015 when Pope Francis came to the U.S.? I'm going to say this. We're going to skip this one. Now, they said that someone posted on the website that Pope Francis says the cross was a failure in a human, human speaking. Friends, if the cross were to be a failure, you and I would have no salvation, no hope of salvation. Even if Jesus Christ, had, Jesus Christ has re resurrected, we would have no hope of salvation. What Bible do you have? Does yours say the cross was a failure also? And now, he says, at, in, on the bottom yellow lines, and if at times our efforts and works seem to fail and produce no fruit, we need to remember that we are followers of Jesus and his life, humanly speaking, ended in the failure, the failure of the cross. 
If Jesus failed at the cross, friends, we would have no hope of salvation, even if he resurrected from the dead. Was it a failure for you? Maybe, maybe not. But it wasn't for me. And actually, someone said the pontiff of Satan. That was on the website, so don't stop me for calling that. But even if it's true, again, when you do not understand something, when desperation hits you, then look at the cross. This is the great failure of God, and that is the destruction of God, and it is a challenge to our faith, and this is hope, because history did not end in that failure. Is he not calling the cross a failure? And people are saying, no, he is not calling a failure, but to the worldly perspective. Then he says, it is 12 o'clock. Are you hungry? How many of you know history? Okay, you know what? Yeah, go back, back over here. Back over here. Back to me. How many of you know history? Not just any history. Bible prophecy history. How many of you heard of something called the Dark Ages? Do you know what it means to be 12 o'clock for the papacy? Do you know what it means to be 12 o'clock for the papacy? No, if you don't, I'll just know right now. Great controversy, again, this book, again. Page 60, paragraph 2. Oh. You want to know that? The noon of the papacy is the midnight of the world. How many of you remember the Dark Ages? If you know the Dark Ages and Reformation, you would know what this means when he says it's almost 12 o'clock. Oh. And who is getting back favors? Who is getting put up now? Is it the Bible? Or is it the Pope? Who are called the men of peace? Hmm. I don't know what news you watch, but those news you will not find it in the TV, friends. Now, as we're talking, as we're talking about the, the, the Bible and the Word of God, we know the loud cry. But someone has been preaching a different loud cry. Someone has been preaching his loud cry. Let's go to Revelation chapter 18. Chapter 18 of Revelation. Verse 2. And he says, and he cried, and an angel, okay, chapter, verse 1 first. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is, fallen is, fallen, and it's become the habitation of the devils, of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit and cage of every unclean and hate, hateful bird. Let's go back to chapter 14 of Revelation, which is called the three angels' messages, from verses 6 through 11. Verse 6, and he says this, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people saying with a loud voice, with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, 
for the hour of, of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Verse 8, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And we see in chapter 18, John is saying, oh, and I see another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. So two times it is repeated that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. But now, I don't know what version you have, but I'm sure that the version that he has is not mine. What is he preaching on? Three voices. Martha Santa Marta. That was last year in November. Let's see what he says. The first voice Francis spoke was the cry, referring to the cry that is the loud voice of the angel. And we just read them right now. As we read in the passage taken from the book of Revelation, proposed for the first reading. And the angel cried with a loud voice, what? Babylon has fallen. I wonder what, what version is he reading from? What does yours, your Bible say? If Babylon has already fallen, why are we still here? Huh. When do you want to preach the loud cry? <laughs> when do you want to preach the loud cry? Because he already started his loud cry. He's perverted loud, 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 loud cry. And he says that corruption grew within the hearts of the people who took it to all of us. They brought it to all of us on the path of corruption. Corruption is the way of living blasphemy, the Pope explained. Corruption is a form of blasphemy. The language of this Babylon, of this worldliness, blasphemy. There is no God. However, there is the God of money, the God of well-being, and the God of exploitation. Now I was wondering, why is that last God a capital G? My Bible says that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. What he is preaching, Babylon has fallen. Now we know that the Babylon, the literal Babylon in time of Daniel had already fallen a long time ago. This is spiritual Babylon because we are in a, we are in a spiritual war, not a physical war. Jesus, when he was on earth, he was not fighting a physical war, but a spiritual war. Huh. What version do you have? Does your Bible say that Satan is the bright morning star also? I don't know. But if you don't think the sanctuary is important, because, friends, when we finish with the sanctuary here, you will see how important it is in Daniel and Revelation, in our time right now. Yes. Guess what? We have been so used to, I want to say it again, we have been so used to eating at Jezebel's table. By the way, if you want to call your daughter a name, do not ever call her Jezebel. Or your son, Ahab. Don't do that. Don't ever do that. But yet, we have been so used to eating at Jezebel's table going to Jezebel's kitchen when God made his bread out of heaven bakery and give it to us, we look at it as, what is this? We are not used to eating good food when God wants us to chew from his bread. We don't want to because we don't think it's a good bread to eat. And as we are studying today, when someone challenges you about your faith, what do you go back to? 
Where do you go back to? The to the Word of God. Oh, you don't think it's good to eat? Then wait till someone challenges you. Then you wonder, oh man, maybe I should eat that bread. Not any type of bread. That's the living bread. Never hunger. Oh yes. So how important is the sanctuary in our time? It is very, very important. And God is allowing events to happen to show us how we are going through the sanctuary right now. Did you be Repent and give your life to Christ? Did you deny yourself and take up your cross? Did you get that bitter herb experience? That's the altar of sacrifice. Did you then get baptized literally in the water by immersion, dead in Christ and raised up in Christ and get the baptism of the Holy Spirit? That's the labor. And do you want to eat from Jezebel's bread or from the bread of God? Yes, we are in a spiritual war, not a physical war. This body is going to die anyway. Yes. So how important is the sanctuary? Hmm? How important? It is very important. And this is why I wanted to start with the sanctuary, because when we get to Daniel, oh, you will see a lot of the sanctuary in it. And I encourage you to read and feed off from the Word of God. I'm going to tell you something right now. The devil came yesterday to tempt me again. Yes? And I asked God to do everything he could not to let me fall in temptation. For five hours, I just kept my mind on my actual exam. I got up, go eat, back to that again. I fought yesterday because I know, I know what I was going to preach today. And the Word of God says temptation is good, but falling temptation is a problem. That's when you sin. How many of us now are willing to study and eat from the bread of God from now on? Well, I am. I don't know about you, but I am. And when someone challenges you, and if you have not done it, then you would think of, you know what, maybe I should go and feed off the bread of God. The everlasting bread, you will never hunger from that point on. May God bless you.